We're in the Gospel of John. And we will be for quite a while. The Gospel of John. Studies in John's Gospel. This is part two. The title is The Light Shining in the Darkness. And the text is John chapter 1, verses 3, 4, and 5. Let me alleviate some fears you might have, because you're thinking, like two, three verses at a time, good night, I'm, I'm going to be 90, and he's still going to be... The first chapter is the slowest chapter. There's so much in chapter 1. There won't be another chapter in the book that we spend as much time on, particularly the prologue, which is usually the title given to John 1, 1 to 18. So we'll be spending more time there than we will on other chapters. It gets also very meaty and dense in John 17, around, around in there. But it'll, it'll, the pace won't be like this all the time. There's just so much here that I want us to study together. John 1, verses 3, 4, and 5. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him, and all the hymns here are referring to Jesus Christ incarnate, the Word made flesh. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Reading from the English Standard Version. And let's pray together. We are so delighted to come again and open up our hearts and minds to your word. It rinses out small and petty thoughts. It purifies a lot of our carnal ambitions. It warms our affections to things that matter. And so Holy Spirit, come and do all those things. Do it in my heart in our hearts as we bow before you around your precious word honoring our precious Lord in a special way in this opening chapter of John's gospel and so do your work here among us I pray in Jesus name Amen I wanted to mention on this do you notice the new front on the bulletin just to say this you need to know, and I have witnesses, that I've talked to Pastor Ron, I talked to Marilyn, and I said to all of them, I said, it's nice, I like the new cover. Could you please, could you please, please, please take my ugly mug off the front of the bulletin? Okay, so this is not here because I want it there. Do you all understand that? It's important for me that you know that. And I got this thing, well, it's not you, Pastor Don. The idea is we want people to know it's the preaching of the word that's central in our worship and blah, 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 blah. But it just bugs me a little bit. I'm not bitter about it. I'm just saying. I know we've already studied the third verse of this opening chapter. But I included it again in the text, not just as a point of mere repetition, I feel like I'm ringing and I'm really loud. Do you hear my voice ringing? Yes, it is ringing. I included it because I think it reveals something of John's continuing argument. John's point, it seems to me, is not only that we can be rescued by Christ in this present moment of history but that we've been created by Christ at the beginning of history and we will return to Christ at the end of history. In other words, Jesus becomes the, the central figure, the point man for all of God's work in this world. So when you're trying to sort out your life, as you turn from expert to expert, as you turn from theory to theory, as you may turn from philosophy to philosophy, religion to religion, what John is saying is that Jesus Christ and his will and his rule, that's where you came from. He designed you. He made you in the first place. He set the terms for life abundant. And he's also where your life is headed eternally. He's the ultimate judge of all. 
he will be Lord over his whole new creation. So what John does is immediately he separates Jesus from anything else. There's, there's no one else who has the claim on you that Jesus Christ has. That's what John is saying. That's the logic behind the plea of John and the gospel. Come, come to this word. Come to this word who has come to bring you life. You were made by this word. Now return to the word. It just makes sense. That's the case John is making here. This is what separates Jesus from a host of other religious options by a country mile. John's gospel, the way he starts this in our text today, it's designed to beg the question, who else could possibly restore us other than the one who first made us? Who else knows how we should live other than the one who first designed us? Come back to the originator of your life. Of course, come to Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, who has life and light. Who else makes sense? There are no other options like this one. But not everyone comes to the light. And that's the key issue that verses 4 and 5 drill down into. There are two really important ideas processed here. Point number one, authentic life continuously flows from Jesus like light continuously flows from the sun. And that's in that fourth verse. In him, John says, in him was life and the life was the light of men. Now don't miss John's big point here. He doesn't merely say that Jesus had life. The point is that he was life. In him was life. So when John described Jesus, he described him as someone who was life and light the way the sun is light. Not the way the moon receives light and reflects it. He's not just talking about someone who passes on a teaching, passes on some gleaned wisdom, gives you some good ideas. Obviously, John means to proclaim the impossibility of life and light apart from Jesus Christ. It was in him. He, he's the source. In the next verse, John will elaborate on the nature of the darkness into which Jesus came in his incarnation. The light shines in the darkness. And we'll elaborate on that in just a minute. But right now, he fastens the terms life and light uniquely to Jesus Christ come in the flesh. And, and John means by this to show that there's a, there's a life from Jesus Christ and he describes it as light because it answers to the darkness we are all in without Jesus Christ. That's what John's doing. He's setting up the need that we have for Jesus Christ. So when he talks about Jesus being light... It's not just a clever term. He's picked that term because in a minute he's going to talk about darkness. Okay? And so he wants us to see that Jesus answers to our problem of darkness in a way that nobody else can. That's what makes John call the life in Jesus Christ the light in that fourth verse. In him was life and the life was the light. It's not an accidental play on words. He is light in the sense of being the opposite to the darkness into which he came. He is the only remedy to our fallenness, our self-deception, our self-destructive, darkened desires and instincts. 
That's what John's trying to say. And it's important. John intends to tell us that there is a darkness in this world and in our fallen hearts that won't be dispelled by anything other than the redemptive life given by God through his son, Jesus Christ. That's what he's trying to say. In, in him. It's in him. The life you need, the light that dispels the darkness, it's only in him. So education won't eradicate this darkness. There's a kind of ignorance that education can eradicate. You want to learn how to drive a car, you can learn to do it. You want to learn how to read, you can do it. You want to learn a second language, you can do it. So there's a kind of ignorance that education can handle, but not, not the darkness in the heart. No amount of scholarship can fix that. Government, the rule of law, even while restraining this darkness, can't remove it, can't fix it. Science, with all its great advances, it can smooth out some of the bumps of civilization, but it can never turn back the power of darkness in this world and in our hearts. And that's because all these human attempts by all these human resources, well, they're all bound up in the same darkness. So our best attempts to fix the darkness come from the darkness. They're a part of the darkness. Take note of some of these big ideas in this fourth verse. First John means to link together the origin, the original life we received from Christ the Creator, with the sustaining life we need from abiding in His presence and grace. John isn't the only one in the Bible to develop that idea. If you, if you look at verses like Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, He, speaking of Jesus Christ, He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature, and he, look at this, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. What makes everything run? What, what, what made the sun come up? We know it doesn't come up, but you know what I mean, the rotation of the, what made the sun come up on the horizon? Well, it's just, that's just the solar system, Pastor Don, it's the way it works. No, it's not. The sun came up this morning because Jesus, God the Son, looked at the sun and said, do that again. That's why it got light today. He upholds, am I making that up? He upholds the universe. Not past tense, right now. He upholds the universe. I love watching some of these nature shows on... Uh, Discovery Channel and some of these things. And I was so pleased about a week ago, a scientist was talking and they were t looking at wolves and the way they track and work according to the same routine year after year after year. And they asked a scientist and this very honest man said, whenever you hear a scientist tell you that they do it by instinct, whenever you hear a scientist tell you that animals do something by instinct, you need to know what that is. That is the scientific jargon for saying, I have no idea why they do that. But we know. He upholds all things by, by the word of his power. So, so what that means is this creation wasn't just, we draw and read it, and we know what we mean when we talk about the creation account, but there's another sense in which it didn't stop. In other words, it isn't just made, wound up, and left to run down. He, he upholds everything. And John's point is, is, is on the spiritual side. That it's not just a matter of getting saved. The life, spiritual life comes from him, only in him. Same ideas in Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. 
and he is before all things. Look at this. And in him, all things, isn't that interesting? Hold together. The idea repeated here is that the universe wasn't just created in one in a one-time act by Christ and you and I along with it, but that it and you and I continue to receive existence by his gracious power. So John reminds us of this truth because, because there's an application to the spiritual life here. This is why John links together the two concepts of life and light in Christ. Just as there would be no life at all on this planet, apart from Christ's original creative power, there can be no ongoing depth of spiritual life, illumination, light, apart from in abiding in that very same Christ. That's what I meant earlier when I said life life continuously flows from Christ just as light continuously flows from the sun. That's the reason John tethers together life and light in that fourth verse. He's exposing he's exposing the foolishness. We're all prone to this, the foolishness of supposing that a disciple can just make some one-time decision to receive spiritual life from Christ and then seek life on his or her own terms. And John, it, that won't work. Because he doesn't just give you life, he, he sustains it. When John says, in him was life, he means to communicate that Jesus doesn't, doesn't just dole out life like you and I give Christmas presents. I mean, those gifts that we give, even if given in love, they're not actually a part of us. They're gifts that are external to our own beings. But, but John says that the life and the light that Jesus gives are never detached from him. In him was life. So he means spiritual life can never be just received independently as some kind of gift without actually being attached to Christ himself on a continuous basis. Just in case some of you might be thinking it, this isn't just theological blah, 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 blah. This truth means something for this church right now and for you right now. There are many, for example, there are many who struggle because they try to just take forgiveness from Jesus as a standalone gift without also receiving the lordship of Jesus and all of its sanctifying power. And it'll never work. Here's another important truth from this fourth verse. We should be encouraged to trust Christ in the face of our repeated sins and failures. Because he is, he is in himself. In him was life. Because he is life in himself, because life and light flow from him as the source, the way light comes from the sun... That means that it's impossible for him, consider this, it's impossible for him to tire or begrudge mercy and grace and spiritual life to those who seek him. Because it's, 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 life is who he is. It's not tied to some emotional whim. In him was life. To have Jesus is to have grace and mercy. There's darkness, to be sure. Don, John's going to talk about it in the next verse. And there are those, to be sure, who won't come to Christ for life and light and grace. And John will talk about those who refuse to receive him in verse 11. But for those who, who fasten their broken lives and all of the pieces, those who come and fasten their broken lives 
to Christ. His grace isn't given out according to some finite bank account. No. His life and light are who he unchangingly is. He can never be otherwise. And because he is the one who is mighty enough, as we read, to sustain all things by the word of his power, then his life, his light, his grace can never be depleted. They are as infinite as his power. In him was life. You, you can't wear out his mercy. You can't bankrupt His grace. For those who fasten themselves to Christ, they fasten themselves to the source of life and light, and it's an infinite source. It's an infinite source. The third thing I want to see in that fourth verse is no one can understand his daily life properly until he sees the finger of God upon every detail of it. So for all who draw breath, the meaning of life can never be fulfilled until they bring Jesus Christ into it. In him. In him. In him was life. So this is the fountain. Jesus Christ. This is the fountain of everything else significant about life and light. That, this insight and conviction is what keeps a life from being misspent. This is the foundation of accountability that shapes care and holiness and hope and a sense of meaning and destiny. Life can never be lived to its proper end or in its proper joy disconnected from the conviction that in him was life. Nowhere else. In him. In him. Point number two. The nature of this world's darkness and its only solution. John chapter 1, verse 5. The light shines, that's what we've been talking about, but it shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not, has not overcome it. So yes, John's gospel is realistic, right out of the gate. The greatness of Christ is placed against the curse of sin. The light shines, to be sure, but it shines in the middle of unimaginable darkness. And the reason John won't hesitate to spell this out is no one will treasure the light until he or she trembles and quakes at the nature and depth of the darkness. Take away the darkness through denial or ignorance and the gospel becomes nothing more than just religious cosmetics. I'm happy you need it. Nice little thing for you. You people go to church, have a lovely little time over there. So the immediate question arises. The light shines in the darkness, 1-5. What is this darkness? The question goes deeper. Why did the Son of God have to come into this darkness? This has been John's declaration. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. But why was it all necessary? Why why wasn't this world transformed by the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments? Why wasn't it fixed? Why wasn't the darkness pushed back by the writings of all the prophets? Why didn't any of that work? I mean, there's this much of your Bible, for goodness sake. Why hasn't the Sermon on the Mount changed this world? 
Jesus gave it. That's the issue here. As John describes the darkness, something's wrong. Notice also the way John uses the term darkness to describe the chief characteristic of this world into which Christ came. That's all he has to say, darkness. It's just, what's the dominant trait of this world? Darkness. Wow. So much so, really, that the the whole, the whole existence can be summed up in one word, darkness? Darkness? That's all there is? And so John means to say, at the very least, John means to say that that everyone and everything is affected by this darkness. He means to say, darkness, this is a universal condition. Darkness, there is no one who escapes this darkness. The light shines in the darkness. Where did Jesus come? To darkness. Where did Jesus live? In darkness. Where did his life shine? Darkness. Where did the light shine? Darkness. We know, Ron's been reading it, the whole world was originally created good. God said so. So obviously something has happened. It's all become darkness. This is where we are. Okay. Well, what's the nature of this darkness? And John lists some of its features. I'm going to try and go through them quickly. First, the darkness manifests itself in mankind's constant, stubborn rejection of the truth. This is the reason. This is the reason John reminds us. The first verse in our text today, the third verse. The reason he reminds us all things were made through him And without him was not anything made that was made. He says that first, and he puts it first so that you would expect when he came, people would recognize him, people would receive him, because it's his world. But John puts the fact that he made it, it's his, and then he he intends to show this brokenness by saying, and even though he made this world, it was all his, he sustains it. When he came, darkness, rejection. Paul states the very same thing in more theological terms and longer terms. That's Paul. Romans 1, 18 to 20. You'll see the very same ideas, though. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, who by their unrighteousness, here's what they do with the truth. They suppress it. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, they've been clearly perceived ever since the creation, here, the creation of the world. That's John 1.3. John 1.3. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. That's Jesus. Paul says the same thing. Since the creation of the world... In the things that have been made. You can see it all. They are without excuse. So, Paul says, the creative power of God, like John 1, 3, it's visible, it's plain. He says the world deliberately suppresses this revelation. Romans 1, 18. That's what John means when he says darkness. Okay, that's what John means. Darkness. Darkness manifests itself, first of all, in mankind's constant, stubborn, that's the important word, stubborn rejection of the truth. We don't want to face up. We don't want to face up to the implications of not being self-owned. We don't want to face up to the implications of not being self-ruled. We hate that. That's the darkness. That's the darkness. Second, the darkness manifests itself in the way they always think in terms of themselves rather than God. 
This is why John begins his gospel declaring the creative rights of God. We aren't our own. We are not independent. We are created entities. We were designed by someone else. The darkness John describes lives as though Jesus was not the creator of all things. The darkness that John describes manifests itself in the way we we always think in terms of ourselves and our rights. When's the last time you heard anybody in a discussion on rights on any network news program or talk show, when have you ever heard anybody say, what are God's rights over his creation? He made it. It is all his. We are not self-determining creatures. What about his rights? No, we don't think that way. We don't think that way. Look at our world. People struggle against their own nature when they turn from God the Son. They confuse life. They frustrate its purpose. By exalting themselves, they insult themselves. That's exactly what Paul means. Romans 1, 22. Proclaiming to be wise, they became fools. So when people forget they have been created in the image of God, they think they can build their lives the way the animals build their lives. Animals build nests. You build houses. They build their lives around accumulation and the fulfillment of desire. Giving little place to Jesus Christ, the creator of all, and the only one in whom, the only one in whom there is life. They turn, look at our world, they turn and they worship movie stars, they worship sports heroes, they worship celebrities, they worship entertainment, they worship pleasure. There, John says, that's the darkness. They don't come to Jesus. But they'll go to anyone else. Any half-naked celebrity that can't button up their clothes, they will worship. Not Jesus. The one who made them. The one in whom there is life. Is there something sadder than that? Is there something sadder than that? Third, the darkness manifests itself in the way people reject the light even when it is shown to them. It's bad enough that people should love darkness. For many, it's all they've known. But the real tragedy, the nature of the darkness that John describes, is revealed in the way that it causes people to disregard the very thing that could give them life. In verses that we'll study in depth shortly, you can see this principle that John deals with. He's emphatic about this. John 1.10. He was in the world. Okay? There he was, right in the world. The world was made through him, yet the world didn't know him. Or look at this one. John 3.19. And this is the judgment. Here it is. Life has come. Jesus came into the world people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil such is the power of the darkness this is how it works inside human hearts and human minds it it bends our interests and affections in the wrong direction it robs our choices of good sense. It locks us into future sins by actually causing us to flee the light of Christ, the one in whom there is light and life. In Him! It's right there! Oh, 
Oh, does that describe any part of your heart today? Do you find yourself wanting freedom and life in Christ on one level, but constantly choosing sin and rebellion over repentance and life? That's the darkness of sin. This is the deep splitting of the human will and personality that the darkness brings. That's the proof. The light shines. Where? In the darkness. I do want to end on that verse. The last point, we're almost done. Is there hope? Is there hope? Pastor Don, man, the way you talk about the darkness. Good night. Is there hope in the face of this darkness? John 1, 5. I want to draw our hearts deeply into two truths, two thoughts from this fifth verse. The light shines in the darkness, true enough, and the darkness has not overcome it. At the risk of being branded too uh, theologically dense for a Sunday morning sermon, I wanted to read you a wonderful quote from one of the really great new commentaries on John's Gospel by Frederick Dale Bruner. And I knew I just couldn't make the point in better words. So just for a minute, wake yourself up, give your husband an elbow, turn off your texting, pour your brain around these words. There's a little bit of, a little bit of theological grist here, so just think. Everybody ready? We're going to think. The present tense verb in that fifth verse is very important. It would actually read, shines on. The light shines on in the darkness. And the present tense verb teaches several important truths. A, that though then, back in John's day, to all outward appearances, it seems that Jesus was terminally executed and that darkness had won a decisive victory. And B, that though now, right now, two, by most outward indications in the present world around us, it honestly seems that darkness, not light, is winning. And that, indeed, it seems like it is darkness that shines on still. See that, nevertheless, all appearances contrary, notwithstanding, it will always be the deepest fact in all of history that in John's inspired words, it is this light, the light of Christ, that shines on in the darkness, and the darkness cannot put it out. This is what faith banks on. We have nothing else to look at that will encourage us. My, I love the hymn. We never sing it. My faith has found a resting place. Not in device or creed, I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough. You still believe it? It is enough that Jesus died. And that he died for me. That's what faith banks on. That's John's final word in our message today in that fifth verse. That's John's word. The light shines on. And let me just say this. We have good evidence from the rest of God's word and the story of history that John was right. And if John were alive today... I'm sure it would bring him the greatest joy 
if he had time to stroll over the whole face of the earth and hang this sign around the necks of about one billion people today. Ephesians 5.8, quote, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. It just shines on. And everyone said, 